Hello everyone, this is Dr. Shi Jun Wang. Um, today's video is going to be quite different with my traditional way of uploading my YouTube videos. I'm not going to talk about a specific uh, piece. Um, so the Chopin Ballad series will continue after this little episode. So today I'm going to focus on the five things that sheet music or music scores does not tell you or something maybe your teacher never taught you, but it's crucial. It's very, very important to understand. And we call this the meaning behind the notes. Okay, um, and this is really due to m many of the students that I'm currently teaching. Um, many things I ask them, where I assume that they are basic knowledges, but they seem not to have any clue on uh, what's a phrasing, what's a legato, how do you do a slur, things like this. So I hope this episode will really help not only the professional or conservatory students, but also with beginner level or intermediate level or somebody who just loves music or loves playing the piano and want to learn a music score like a professional, okay? Of course, this is something I'm not teaching you how to read notes or rhythm. I'm assuming all of that you've already know, you can read, but then how do you discover meanings behind the notes? Um, the most important, number one, is the understanding of phrasing. Um, and there are, of course, many ways to say what is a phrase, um, or many people assume that the slur is the most obvious indication of a phrase, that is totally correct, okay? Phrase can be bigger phrases or can be in smaller unit, yes? One slur is the smallest unit of a phrase. Um, the smallest is a two-note slur. However, I've really discovered that if I ask 10 students how to play a slur, um, they all give me the same wrong answer. Um, a slur means notes connected. Um, and then I asked them, then, um, if you play two notes and, and you, you want them to be connected, um, uh, how do you achieve this connection? And they say, don't lift the fingers. So the next question, the third question I will ask them then, does this sound connected to you? They say, no, of course, they, they say, no. Yeah, it sounds awful, it sounds aggressive, it sounds separated, but then I didn't even lift my fingers. Yeah, the first note I held, yeah, it was almost like I treated it like a tie, I, I'm holding it, but it doesn't sound connected, it doesn't sound legato. Then that really breaks down their whole belief of how to play legato, yeah? Notes, hands, not leaving the key really doesn't work. Um, so the true meaning of legato, more or less, is a um, indication of dynamic, much more so than note connected. So if we break down into the smallest unit, the two-note slur, yeah? Of course, the finest example would be the beginning of the uh, Tempest Sonata. Yeah? So D, the first note is deep, second note is less. Yeah, or we may approach it with a different angle. The first note we really place down. And then the second one, let go. So the second one is not a new strike. It's something left over that you have, you use to, to play that, okay? Not a separate strike, but a byproduct from the first attack. Yeah? Or you might say down, up, or deep, and then let go. 
And but to the very es essence of this, it's really the first one more, second one less. Um, and of course, there are probably many, many different length of a legato. Sometimes we see a three note legato, and what in front of me is a very easy beginner level sonatina by Kurao. Um, this one, yeah, that probably every kid is studying piano in Asia, in America, in Europe, everyone probably know a little bit about this or play this. So uh, there is a, a example here in the development section. Yeah, so that's, that's a three note slur. So what I did is the first note, I approached the note from the key and it's not a accented notes. It's a pickup. It's I play it gently, and then the second note is the core. The second note is the main note where we have to go to. So, and then the third note, the last, the ending of a slur. Most of the time, unless it's Beethoven with a sforzando sign on it, which he does all the time, but usually is. Less. So when we play like that, there, there is emotion in it, there is musical phrasing in it. So really, the slur, this is the most important concept I want everyone to know, I want to share with everyone, that slurs are indication of dynamic, much more so than just than connecting fingers. It has nothing to do with connecting fingers. The second important thing that I see in all uh, piano students struggling with or I'm not satisfied with is this concept of balance. Balance is something only in the beginner level um, piano student face because most of other instruments they have only one voice. Okay, violin, mostly they play one voice. Clarinet, mostly they play single notes. Um, but in piano we have, at the very beginning stage, we have left hand and right hand. We have one hand playing melody, one hand playing accompaniment. So, uh, I'm sure everyone was told by their teachers, less in the accompaniment part, or less left hand, yeah, because the beginning repertoire most of the time the left hand has the uh, accompaniment part. Um, I want to share one very, very wise advice or uh, statement by a uh, Julia professor. And he said, um, your left hand really determines the volume of the whole section. Yeah, the right hand really has nothing to do with it because the left hand, if it's too loud, right, then, then the right hand cannot change that fact, yeah? And how soft your right hand can play depends on so how soft your left hand can achieve, yeah? And in my opinion, even much less than the right hand. And if we know a little bit about the structure of, of the piano, we know strings in the lower register, yeah, is much thicker with copper wire around it, so the vibration is, way more than yeah see i'm not even lifting my finger but the sound disappears after two seconds so that's already a unfair competition and in most of the situation the left hand or the accompanying part outnumbers the melody yeah so i have one two three while my left has 12, yeah? And this is not just uh, in sonatina, yeah? Yeah, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, 20 plus notes already passed, yeah? So what am I thinking when I try to have a proper balance? Not more, less, but 20 times more, 20 times less, yeah? And 
to achieve this super soft left hand, you have to play from the keys. It gives you better control. Yeah, minimum movement. So it's not like that. Um, I still remember my Julia professor Kalikstein, Mr. Kalikstein, always tell me. Yeah, whenever I play Beethoven, uh, I think I've learned five or six entire Beethoven sonatas with him in uh, uh, two years. He said. Don't work too hard. Your left hand works too hard. Yeah. So so basically, he's telling me just less left hand. Don't lift. Don't work. Don't like work out like you're in the gym. But just minimal movement. Yeah. Leave some space to the right hand. Okay. The third important thing that you cannot know by just reading the score, you have to have somebody <laughs> telling you is the grouping. The grouping of notes, and this is really、um, important when you have a lot of notes in one phrase or under one slur. Yeah, when you have two, everyone can play two. But when you have twenty, how to group them properly and have the correct relaxation、uh, within each small unit, so that you don't tight yourself,、uh, you don't. Uh, just be so tired that you cannot continue.、Um, and in this easy piece, we have a couple of measures that you have sixteen notes all the way.、Yeah? yeah, two measures full of sixteen notes. I assume even if you don't learn how to relax or how to group,、um, you can still finish it.、Yeah? Very tense. And you can have a breather here, but then it comes again. But wait until you move to, let's say, Beethoven sonata or Chopin pieces or Liszt pieces. Then you have this all over the page. Then if you don't learn how to relax or how to regroup,、um, you can't finish. And the number one rule of grouping, running notes like this is by hand position. Okay, so just for instance here. The first three notes, G, A, B, I don't change hand position, but then the next note, the next four notes, I have to use a new brand new hand position. So there is a crossing under,、yeah. and with in each grouping, my wrist has a down up or up and down, whatever you call it, a down up motion. That's Basically, like how you breathe when you're swimming. The next group has five notes. The next group has three, and all of these I strictly follow the hand positions. Yeah, the next one has much more. Seven, and then two, and of course, I don't want to. Show my audience that I'm making these weird groupings, so I don't play.、Uh, I'm not playing like this, so I'm playing.、Uh, yeah, the goal is. That to not let anybody detect what you're doing, and I call this the separation of musical phrase and technical phrase. Yeah, so it's one phrase, but I'm really secretly breaking them into uh, different uh, groupings. And this is, of course, the most basic one. And there are some complicated one. And for those who have watched my Chopin Etude series. In the、uh, Opus Ten Number Four, yeah, this is of course something college kids play or、uh, very ambitious,、uh, very talented, ambitious、uh, pianist play.、Um, and here, if we group them with the beats, with the down beats, then it's hard. But if we start on the third note. Yeah, then it becomes way easier because the ref 
fraction counts is less. Yeah, we are not going up and downs all the time. We are having one direction. Yeah. So there are really different tricks in the grouping, and I'm not going to first tell you each situation. And there's no way to know each situation. Every piece is different. But then that's some general ideas of the necessity of note grouping. Number four, uh, that you know by this by reading the score, but you don't know why or you don't know the importance of it, is rhythm. And again, um, see, um, uh, recently I was reading this book called Stolen Time. It's it's just one thick book, only talking about tempo rubato. Yeah, stolen time. Mean, rubato means to rob. Yeah, to rob some time. Um, and that's just one little the tip of the iceberg about this whole topic, rhythm. So I'm not, of course, going to talk about rhythm in general, but something that is helpful for beginners or for uh, early uh, or early advanced students is the importance of some special types of rhythm. Number one is the dotted rhythm. Dotted rhythm meaning <laughs> yeah. And when we, when we learn the dotted rhythm, um, many teacher teaches long, short, long, short, long. And I don't know if it's just me or my students. Naturally, we want to group the short note together with the previous long note. So long, short, that makes up one beat. And then another long, short. So mathematically, it makes sense. But musically, the short notes actually should be grouped with the following long note. It belongs to the following long note. Uh, long note. So long, short, long, short, long, short, long. It should always go to the next long note. Yeah. So it's not. But bam, 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 or. Feel that drive. It's almost like the long note is a magnet that want the small note to be closer to it. The other thing that I often see students missing out is the importance of uh, syncopation. Yeah, syncopation is something special. Yeah, and of course, late Beethoven. Yeah, you might even get syncopation that feels like jazz. And of course, it's not jazz. It's <laughs> pure. It's classical. And I don't think jazz musicians knew Beethoven late sonatas to be inspired by that. It's just a funny coincidence. But in many cases, um, syncopation means intensity. So if we have, yeah, you don't come in on the downbeat, which is normal, but you come in on the second uh, part of that beat. You feel this energy accumulating instead of. It feels like it's so easy. Yeah, it's, it's nothing special. So things like this, students need to pay attention to. Yeah, of course the meter, uh, four four or, or or six eight, they all have different uh, feelings. Yeah, the dance music in three or in duple or in triple, it, it gives you different feelings, different atmosphere. Um, so that is really something, not only to do it correctly, but to do it vividly. And then the last point I want to make is harmony. And again, that's, I think, even a bigger topic. <laughs> uh, there are many books written on harmony, on tonal harmony. Uh, music theory is majority part of it. It's about harmony. Um, and people argue about harmonies. Um, and that's something I've never seen a score indicating. Yeah, uh, different versions, different editions. Some have give you a different set of fingering. Some gives you even uh, different uh, dynamic signs. 
a different tempo. Yeah, we see that all the time. But I've never even seen the one book that provides the Roman numerals underneath each chord. Yeah, this is one. This is five. Maybe maybe later, <laughs> one uh, crazy uh, editor will will put that in. But why are those helpful? Um, I just want to make very two quick points. Yeah, dominant seven resolving to tonic. Yeah, so many times I've heard students play professional students students who has great facilities but when they play chords in the left hand they play as if every note sounds exactly the same but what's missing out here the understanding of dominant seven resolving resolving to the tonic chord. And we see this all the time in major, in minor, in Haydn, Beethoven, Chopin, Rachmaninoff. Uh, you know, Rachmaninoff has more notes, but if you really analyze the uh, harmony under, uh, underneath, it's, it's the same thing. So I don't want to hear th these played, uh, for instance, in this very easy piece. <laughs> Because this, this is the resolution of that. So eventually the last note has to be uh, softer. And of course there are many exceptions. Yeah, this is kind of like learning German. Yeah, I'm currently learning German. You know the rule. And then you have to memorize a thousand exceptions. <laughs> yeah, so uh, a lot of the times when it's the ending, you don't want to be, yeah, you don't want to resolve in that way. You want to resolve in a kind of a strong way. Yeah, but, and, and of course in Beethoven, um, he had this famous signature called the wrong accent. Yeah, sometimes he would put, a sfazando or a accent on a, a note that's supposed to be soft or supposed to be resolution, but that's his signature, yeah, that you have to follow that. But if there is no indication, that's the main rule we should follow. Resolution is less. And of course, um, the other very significant thing that I want the students to, to know or to be more sensitive about is the modulations. And again, I, I can give you a million very, very different examples of, of modulation. And basically all the good composers modulate. Yeah. Um, but something significant and something that often I, I don't see students pay attention enough is modulation between major minor, or uh, minor to major. Um, that big impact that it gives us or the changing mood that give us it's so important that if you don't feel it, if you don't show it, it, it really sh shows that you're ignorant of, of harmony. Um, one good example I can give, and every single Schubert <laughs> pieces, you can have many examples, but uh, here um, the uh, impromptu opus, num uh, opus uh, 90, number four. Uh, see, that gives you a different feeling. Yeah, this is A flat minor. It's not sad, it's not too sad, but it's not uh, a bright bright sunshine. Yeah? yeah, I had a master class with um, Brando when I was studying at Juilliard, and he told me this is kind of a, a drizzling like little ring drizzling. I guess he lives in London. That happens all the time. That's uh, what came up in his mind. But then in the middle, suddenly that C flat becomes C natural. Yeah, that gives you hope. Yeah, that gives you a little bit of brighter If 
my student can can feel that change to to this, then I will be really a happy teacher. And I can give you other examples of special chords. For instance, Neapolitan six, yeah, F minor, second time out of nowhere. Yeah, it's a G flat major, almost like I'm on Mars suddenly. I'm not. I don't know where I am. Yeah. yeah. So if the students can show their understanding of these harmonic changes, then it's something Beethoven didn't tell you. It's something the publication uh, house didn't tell you. But it's something you have to know to show and. I'm sure Beethoven wanted you to to show those differences. Um, and again, each topic, phrasing, balance, note grouping, rhythm, and harmony. Each topic, I probably can give you uh, another hundred examples, or I can maybe do another three episodes on each. But I hope these five things will help students to notice the the treasure behind the notes can really translate the dead notes printed on flat pages into something more meaningful, into something more vivid, and you can translate dead notes into a nice story or into a colorful picture. Um, thank you for watching. Um, I hope this is a nice breather for my followers. Um, to, to really gain something in a general idea instead of a specific piece. But the Chopin Ballade series will continue next week. Um, thank you for watching. See you next week.